begin. Tonight you're in for a treat. Why I'm proud to see the works of friends such as Max Talley, Trey Dowell, Shelly Lonecoff, and my buddy Ben Vessels put together in one package. I was more pleased because Delirium Corridor is an exemplary collection of short stories. The stuff in here is pretty jacked up, but I, but I say that in the most admirable. However, it does make me wonder about what goes on in the collective minds of these writers, especially the author who leads off tonight's reading, Max Talley. Max DeVoe Talley is fiction and essays have appeared in a NFA Literary Review, Fiction Southeast, Volume 1, Brooklyn, Gravel, Attic Review, Litro, and Entropy. Your future novel, Yesterday, Yet Tomorrow, published in 2014 and he teaches a writing workshop at the Santa Barbara Writers Conference and Santa Fe workshops. Check out his stuff on maxdevotally.com. Welcome Max. Thank you for having all of us tonight Michael. My pleasure. I, I have to wonder how this all came about such a great collection that, um, from beginning to end there's so many strong stories. And if you can briefly tell us how this all came about. Sure. I've had an idea for a while to do an anthology in the spirit of the Twilight Zone and also of Black Mirror, a more recent anthology TV series. Mm. So the idea was to have stories that they could be horror or science fiction, or they could be crime, surreal, as long as they fit the overall theme then they would be good for this. So I basically put out a call to people I know, and I've known you, I'm not sure, what was your first year at the Santa Barbara Writers Conference? Was it 20, 2005, 2006? Yeah, somewhere around there, yeah. Okay, so I, I knew people from there, so from about 15 years ago, also people from literary journals, people from New York, and so I sent out a call and almost everybody responded. So that made me pretty happy. And I thought, okay, this could actually happen. That was a year ago. Then things happened and we got delayed a little bit, but in some ways that helped because we got some more better stories, more art. And I think the, the uh, collection actually improved a little bit because of the delay. Mm -hmm. Did you always want to put together something like, and everybody wants to know everything. A you know, short uh, story. Yeah. You mean a connected short stories? I, I didn't hear the yeah. question. Did you always want to put together, you know, as a writer, we want to publish. Sure. I think novelist. I think anyone who writes short stories wants to do a collection of their own works, but also I like anthologies where you get to sample a bunch of other people. When I was a kid, I read the Alfred Hitchcock Presents series. Ray Bradbury, well, those were all Ray Bradbury stories, but there were science fiction collections that were a bunch of different writers and it's a way to be introduced to a whole bunch. And then you can mm. follow those writers, read more of their stories, their novels. And so I've always loved the idea of anthologies. Well, you put together a good one, Max. And tonight we're gonna start off with your story. I'm Correct. Yes, I'm going to read the beginning of Delirium Corridor, where each of us are going to read a little part of the story, but not the whole thing, because that would ruin it. So here we go. Jeremy Rebus startled awake. A voice throbbed inside. Go to work. Go to work. It sounded familiar. He'd been an assistant manager at Transitions Unlimited for 10 years, perhaps longer. Everything seemed clear once, but of late he was bedeviled by confusion irked by an amnesiac fog cast over essential details. A week ago, an intriguing coworker asked, how old are you? Normally, he found such questions invasive. However, Christina had inquired with a sly smile. Perhaps she wondered if Jeremy was in her acceptable potential dating range, she being around 35. Jeremy paused in mystification. I, uh, uh, don't be shy. Christina played with her blonde hair that showed dark roots. I know you're older, that's cool. She eyed him, 45? Trying to end the strained moment, Jeremy said, exactly, you guessed it. She nodded with a smirk and returned to her cubicle. He now felt determined to confirm his age. Jeremy ransacked his studio apartment but couldn't find a driver's license. 
No wonder he lived in the center square neighborhood of Albany, just blocks from Transition's office. His license had either expired or he never sought one in the first place. Jeremy found credit cards, though no birth certificate. He Googled his name. Five different people came up. None of their photos resembled him. Their ages ranged from 23 to 87. Jeremy then noticed his flat screen TV atop the dresser had vanished. Worse, after checking his pockets, his wallet containing 100 in cash was gone. What the hell? Noticing the digital clock showing 845, he quickly dressed and raced to work. The main room at Transitions held connected cubicles. People in between jobs and those unemployed for longer periods came in to sharpen their resumes or to be referred for temp work in permanent positions. Sometimes they just received a pep talk, part employment agency and part counseling service. Jeremy worked in a smaller back room, now a graveyard for broken office equipment. Other associates refused to work there anymore. The fluorescent light tubes overhead buzzed loudly, and sometimes the volume increased to bug zapper in kill mode frequency. The air vent system occasionally malfunctioned, emanating a foul, rotting odor. Coworkers claimed to hear anguished voices through the outer walls at night. Jeremy didn't notice. One associate had complained about Jeremy to his friend Titus Wilson. That guy goes into a trance for hours just typing frantically, not talking, ignoring us, Marianne had said. He's either an arrogant prick or he's been, you know, drop kicked at birth. Jeremy sat at a heavy oak desk pressed against the rear wall. Beyond the desk stood a door with three outsized locks on it. He'd been entrusted with a secret. The never to be opened door led to a hallway leading to another locked door for an office in the adjoining building. Why this suspended bridge passageway existed was never discussed. Only Thad Wexler, the director of transitions, knew anything of its origin. A reclusive man, Wexler refused to venture into the office. Jeremy opened a file and began typing letters, numbers, and symbols at super speed. All day, every day, he filled blank documents with incomprehensible gibberish. Sometimes he theorized he must be writing code, even though transitions did not employ in-house coders. Jeremy's fingers moved on their own accord. At the end of the week, he received a decent paycheck and his apartment rent was auto paid by transitions. Jeremy's terms of employment dictated that he be the last person to leave the office. During a morning break, Jeremy found himself unlocking his desk lowest drawer. He hovered on a distant plane, watching one hand feel around until his fingers touched cold metal. Three keys on a keychain for the locks on the sealed door. A bolt of electric pain shot through his forehead. Keep them on your person, always. Thad Wexler stressed this over and over in voicemails. Where did he lose them and how did they end up back in his desk? Jeremy returned to manic automatic typing. His sandwich arrived every day at 1 p.m. Titus set the food on Jeremy's desk and sniffed the air. Damn, it stinks in here. And whatever died in those air vents, I'm definitely allergic to. He studied Jeremy with sympathy. Hey man, you wanna eat outside with us? Sorry, Jeremy replied, too much work to finish. Not to pride, but what exactly do you do? Words vomited up from Jeremy's throat. I catalog each person who comes in, file their information, calculate the success and failure rate, then submit the data to Thad Wexler. He smiled. That way we can continually improve our interface with humanity. Interface with humanity? Titus laughed. You sound like a robot sometimes, dude. Anyway, you hear about Christina? Disappeared. No one can reach her. Didn't give her notice or anything. Christina? Yeah, numb nuts, the woman you were flirting with. Titus leaned against the wall. Good thing for you, nothing happened. She had this sketchy boyfriend, Krieger, who did time for robbery, a second story guy. Titus lowered his voice. Christina pretend dated Armando, he pointed toward the outer office. After their second date, Armando's house got broken into, lost a watch, some clothes, and cash. Wow. Jeremy considered his missing television and wallet. She was pretty hot, but good riddance. Titus exited the back room. Jeremy continued working until he heard the last associates departing at seven. As the office went quiet, Jeremy experienced a sudden memory flash. He had dated Christina last Saturday. Not only that, but they slept together. When he woke the following morning, his bed was distressed yet empty. As someone without a girlfriend, Jeremy should have recalled their sex in detail, but he couldn't. When he scrunched his brow and concentrated, words scrolled across his mind. Satisfactory, adequate, followed by perfunctory, brief. Had Christina's overtures been a way to get his home keys and copy them? 
Perhaps Krieger, the shady boyfriend, robbed the apartment while Jeremy toiled the transitions. At 8.30, Jeremy patrolled the main room, making sure the private offices were locked before leaving. A loud thump sounded from the back. Jesus, did the jumbo screen for his computer fall over? Everything looked the same, nothing broken or toppled. He rolled his swivel chair to the center of the room and sat listening. Jeremy heard a distant female scream, but assumed it came from the street. Motherfuckers, let me out of this place, a man shouted. Jeremy lurched backward. The voice had issued from beyond the triple locked door. Someone trapped. Maybe the adjoining office in the next building had left their door open and a custodial worker wandered across the hallway then got locked in. It really wasn't Jeremy's business and his internal voices began repeating, never open the door, never open the door. He found Thad Wexler's private number for emergencies only. Wexler's phone rang eight times then a distorted wash of white noise came through Jeremy's earpiece. Hello, Mr. Wexler? The harsh sound grew louder frothing and crackling until the line went dead. Jeremy, a woman yelled from beyond the door. It's Christina, I'm stuck in here, please let me out. Jeremy froze, unable to retreat or step forward. Listen, I know you're pissed I copied your keys, but I like you. Set me free and we'll spend another night like last Saturday. She paused. You are fantastic, by the way. Jeremy fished the keys from his pocket. He heard an agonized shriek, then silence. His body felt numb, but he slid his cumbersome desk away and unlocked the three locks. A dank, moldy stench seeped out from the open door. Jeremy walked into the dark corridor. And then it gets really crazy after that. So our next reader will be Trey Dowell. I met Trey at the Santa Barbara Writers Conference in 2012, I believe. Um, his acclaimed novel, The Protectors, was published by Simon & Schuster, and his short stories have appeared in a number of places, including Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine. Please take it away, Trey. Thanks, Mac. Appreciate it. And thank you for including me in this anthology. It's a huge honor, and thanks to Chaucer's for letting me drone on for five to seven minutes. Um, so my story in the anthology is called Ruthless Efficiency, and I'm going to read to you about Eh, the first third of it. Steve Wiggins' first day as CEO was relatively quiet and uneventful, right up until his refrigerator tried to kill him. The red light flashing on the fridge's control panel seemed fairly innocuous. Change filter. When Wiggins walked into his kitchen after work that evening and noticed, he frowned. Twelve million for a waterfront mansion, he thought. Another mill to automate the damn thing, and I still gotta change the freaking water filter. Regardless, the Outer Bank's public water was some of North Carolina's foulest, metallic and overly chlorinated, and Wiggins' taste buds won out over his irritation. He opened the fridge's double doors and found the filter housing at eye level. When he tried to twist the filter to release it, though, the long cylinder didn't budge. Wiggins flexed his meaty fingers and gave it a second try, this time with more force. The filter rotated, but slowly the plastic housing squeaking in protest. Come on, you piece of shit, he grunted. Wigan took a step to the side, trying to get a better grip on the release tab. And with a sustained groan, coaxed the red indicator line closer and closer to the open mark. The instant the mark lined up, Wigan felt the tension ease and the foot-long metal cylinder exploded out of the housing like a torpedo. A cold rush of air blasted Wiggins' cheek as the metal tube rocketed across the kitchen, splintering the mahogany cabinetry built into the far wall. Jesus Christ! His eyes bulged, doing a double take between the now empty filter housing and the cracked cabinet opposite the fridge. If I hadn't moved, he thought, that thing would have hit me right between the eyes. Wiggins slammed the door shut and leaned against the kitchen island until his heart rate slowed. Eventually, he turned toward the blue E logo emanating from a wall-mounted touchscreen next to the triple ovens. Electra, he muttered, notify maintenance that the refrigerator needs service. Gonna need a carpenter, too. A feminine, sultry voice, uh, of which I am neither, so you'll just have to believe me, um, purred out of the touchscreen. Of course, Steve. The blue light pulsated with each word. I'll add both appointments to your calendar. Wigan let out a hmm of tacit approval and made a beeline for the wet bar. Tequila seemed like a safer choice than water. Scene break. The day had started pleasantly enough. 
a meeting in the opulent 45th floor conference room where the chairman introduced Wigan to the rest of the board members as the newest chief executive officer of Palmerston Technologies. Hell, the old man had even pulled out the head chair for him. Wigan plopped down the smooth burgundy leather whimpering as he took his long sought after seat at the table. Obsequious clapping followed, most from board members who, up until the announcement, had been rivals looking to, to nab the job for themselves. His job. CEO of a Fortune 100 company, $40 billion in revenue, over 30,000 employees, $15 million a year salary plus stock options worth 10 times that much. As the clapping continued, satisfaction washed over him. Wiggins took a deep breath and smiled. Clap away, you bastards, he thought. None of you has the balls to do what I did to get this job. Scene break. Wigan drained a final gulp of Patron and headed for the master suite. Surveillance cameras tracked every step. Motion sensors activated the overhead lights at 60% intensity wherever he went. Mellow strains of Spanish guitar emanated from strategically placed wireless speakers. Within seconds of arriving home, the system controlling the house had identified Wigan via facial recognition and adjusted to his preferences. Lights, music, even the artwork. More than 50 picture frames hung throughout the 5,000 square foot home, but they didn't display canvas. Instead, ultra high definition flat screens of various sizes lay with, within ornate wooden frames. For 100th the price of an actual Monet, Wigan's house could display Monet's work in any room at his whim. If he wanted to move a painting, Wigan only needed to point at a frame and tell Electra what to display. In the bedroom, Wigan preferred more abstract work. Pollock and Kandinsky greeted him as he stripped off his tie and moved toward the bathroom. Toward the bathroom. He took one step over the bath threshold, then stopped. He craned around to peer back at the king-size bed. The large frame above his headboard usually displayed Pollock's convergence, but tonight Munch's The Scream looked back at him. An agonized face, hands pressed against cheeks, screaming beneath a bloody red sky. Brow furled, he called out. Electra, why is this painting above my bed? The control panel mounted near the bedroom door bloomed with blue light. The artwork is displayed according to your preferences, Steve. I know that, he said, impatient. Convergence is supposed to be in that frame. Why is this? A display change cut him off, and Pollock's work showed above the bed once again. Wigan twisted back toward the pad. Lock that frame until I tell you to change it. Of course, Steve. Wigan kicked off his Ferragamo loafers, then his socks. While bent over, he caught a flash of movement in his peripheral vision. Metal slats slowly descended from above each of the picture windows of the bedroom, covering the view of the pristine beach and the darkening ocean below. Electra, why are you lowering the hurricane shutters? The voice was as nonchalant as ever. There is a wind advisory in effect tonight. 40 mile per hour gusts are forecast. It's prudent to deploy the hurricane shutters for any wind speed above 30. Fine. Refrigerator's bad enough. I don't need broken windows too. The shutters finished their descent. Wigan heard the hollow thunk as they locked into place. He shook his head, marveling at the efficiency. This house can do anything. And trust me, it does not get better for Wigan. Good job, Trey. No problem. Now I have to introduce a writer who is much more accomplished than I am. So I'm going the, to- I want to finish the story. <laughs> Hey, that's a good, that's, that's good. If people want to buy it, you know, it might just be available at Chaucer's.com. Exactly. 1599, nice. 15 <laughs> stories. Did you see that seamless, <laughs> that seamless plug that we just did? All right. I so, love you, Trey. Thank you. <laughs> it is my honor and privilege to introduce M.M. DeVoe. M has won more than 20 writing awards, including wow. various editor's choice prizes, a Shirley Jackson award, and four Pushcart nominations. For those of you who don't know, a Pushcart nomination, the Pushcart Prize is kind of like short story writers Oscars. So a graduate from Columbia University's MFA program where she was a writing fellow, she okay. writes short fiction, shorter poetry, you just sit there and let me introduce you, and very <laughs> long novel manuscripts, and is the executive director of a literary nonprofit she founded in New York City. Today is the launch date of her first published book, so please hold it up. There you go. 
a memoir about her first 10 years running Pen Parentis, which helps writers stay creative after having children. And oh my God, I wish this had come out two years ago. <laughs> it is called Book and Baby, The Complete Guide to Managing Chaos and Becoming a Wildly Successful Writer Parent. She is very grateful to be reading from Delirium Corridor tonight because truth be told, even if her local bars weren't closed because of coronavirus, she would far rather be doing a fiction reading at a cool bookstore in Santa Barbara in mid-January than doing almost anything in wintry Manhattan right now. So, so take it true. away, Em. <laughs> Thanks, Trey. No problem. <laughs> and thank you, Chaucers, for hosting. And thank you, Mac, for inviting me. I am excited to be in California. <laughs> <laughs> I really wish I was in California. It's virtual California. Really, really, really cold in Manhattan. So, um, this is the book. Buy it from chassers.com. Uh, my story is called Left Brain. This is from the middle. At school, the lovely young teachers thought Potom was adorable. They treated his condition as a quirky improv game. And, added the, uh, and asked the other kids to speak in colors or in Spanish or in rhymes. The other mothers whispered that my husband had pushed pot on too hard as a toddler, that math flashcards were a form of child abuse. I probably should have told them that I had been on board with the flashcards. I'd enjoyed them as much as pot on. It was a family treat to laugh at the wrong answers and celebrate the right ones. My husband had loved math facts as a child and assumed his only child also would. The little boy's brain was flexible and sponge-like and learning was hilarious and fun, a challenge to be enjoyed. Tiny Potom strove to make his father grin and pat him on the head, scoop him into his arms and cuddle him, calling him little professor. For that attention, Potom would have memorized anything, state capitals, ingredients in sponge cake, ancestors back 10 generations, breeds of dogs, chemical formula. It was just a game to him. This talking in numbers though, this was different. You look sad, Potom. is everything okay? Quick shake of the head, short buzz cut doesn't even move, eyes dart from side to side, terrified. Bubble of snot pops beneath his tiny brown cauliflower nose. Can I help? A shrug from little shoulders, bony as a quail, fragile. I hand him a crayon and a piece of paper. Can you draw what's wrong? He covers the page in numbers. The first appointment I can get with the school psychiatrist is six days later, a 10 minute time slot. When I walk into the room, Dr. Thaddeus P. Wall sets an egg timer shaped like a tomato, settles with his hands tented in front of his Freudian goatee and indicates with a condolatory look that my time is already running out. I place the paper with Potom's cry for help and six others like it in front of him a page of the number nine in various colors, a page of all even numbers in gold and black, every sixth number upside down, a page of purple fours, a jumbled page of numbers in every one of the 64 colors from the Crayola box, no patterns on this last page, each number a different size, each unique as if they're all snowflakes or fingerprints. My son did these, I tell Dr. Wall. I'm sure the principal has brought you up to speed. I want to know what's wrong with him. That's a very judgmental attitude to have towards a four-year-old Mrs. Patel. I could tell he was lumping me in with every other Patel he had ever come across in his 60 year lifespan. Give your son a chance to explain himself. That's this one, I replied. I held up a page of the number one in black Sharpie. It looked like a field of thorns. It looked like a prison tally. It looked like a crazy person had drawn it. I found Potom under the dining table, quaking and sobbing, humiliated, terrified. Potom, I cooed, it's okay. 
I crouched down to stroke the little boy's quivering, huddled body, and when I saw the underside of that table, my legs gave out. It had been carved with a series of fours and sevens, sometimes in pairs, sometimes in rows, sometimes overlapping, as if one number might eliminate the other if he could just dig deep enough into the wood. Thousands of digits, hundreds of messages. This could not have been done in a week. This cry for help had taken months. Right, so that's my story. <laughs> um, I, am, I am thoroughly delighted to be able to introduce Fred Williams. Fred Williams is an American novelist and short story writer known for his dark and suspenseful Twilight Zone style. Fred was featured in the Santa Barbara Literary Journal in 2019. His first novel, The Thriller Scramble, was released to critical acclaim in August of 2020 and is available now, maybe even at Chaucer's. Um, he is a former bodybuilder and among other, and that's among a lot of other talents. And he lives in Ventura, California and divides his free time between writing, spiritual growth and the gym. Please join me in welcoming Frederick T. Williams. Yay. All right, first off, I wanna say that I am uh, immersed oh, in, is. I'm immersed in a, a lot of talented writers. There is it's just unbelievable. Um, Without the ongoing support of my family, friends, and this great network of writers, I wouldn't be here. So Max, I just wanna say thank you and I really appreciate this opportunity. I also wanna say hi, babe, love you. Fred, right. can I say one thing about your story? Yes. It's told from the perspective of a woman speaking to her sister on the phone yes. While, yes. She's, while she's trailing a man through a clothing store. Yes, that's correct. Take thank it away. Perfect, appreciate it. Are you under lengthy periods of extreme stress? I ignored his voice in my head and popped open the aspirin bottle, shook three into my hand. He was clockwork like a rooster, interrogating me every morning. I punched the wall when Dr. Gilly whispered in my ear, you did it again, didn't you? None of your damn business. Why'd you do it, Ronez? Because, because he wanted it. It won't make the pain go away, Dr. Gilly said from behind me. Stop it, stop it, stop it. I snapped back into my blue bathroom with seashells and mermaids on the walls. Every night, men approached me and said just enough to wrap their filthy hands around me by closing time. They think I'm that easy, but they're wrong. And every morning, Dr. Gilly asked the same damn questions after I give those boys what they deserve. Rashid, Evan, Donovan, Brooklyn, and last night, <laughs> my best catch yet. In my closet, tucked away deep inside, they can sit together and exchange stories about the chicks they bang while they rot. Birds of a feather can die together. Hey, what's up? I answered the call from my sister Octavia. Hey, little sister, what's going on? Nothing much, I'm down at the mall shopping. What about you? Girl, please, I'm good over here. I put her on speaker and began scrolling through, my through the photo she sent me last week. Bingo. Anyway, how's mom? I asked as I followed the man from her photo into J.S. Steele, premier clothier. I walked over to the men's section, thought I lost a dude, but he was looking at a dress shirt a few aisles over. Girl, you know Sylvia Lee is still Sylvia Lee also known as June Cleaver. Yep, that's the guy. It's rare to see green eyes on a man that dark skin. I moved behind a rack of pants to watch him decide between two shirts. He put the red shirt back on the rack 
I hung the orange one in front of him. Hey, I listened to your voicemail the other day. What happened with you and Jacob? I watched the guy position a pair of brown slacks in a mirror next to his slim frame. Girl, nothing. That bastard stood me up. Again? I slammed a pair of pants on the rack. The first time, he apologized, saying his baby mama came over at the last minute and left the baby with him. That's messed up, I said. After I let him off the hook, I caught him in another lie. That asshole said we need to catch a basketball game soon and how he had such a good time with his boys last Thursday. The day he was babysitting, I guessed. Ronez, I thought something was up. But when he stood me up the second time, I deleted the number and all his damn messages. Goodbye. What an asshole. Yeah, when he wanted to spend the night, you better believe he was on time. He had the green eyes, right? And those crazy looking shoes too. Girl, yes, those clear Nike Air Force Ones with blue socks to match. There is just something about shoes on a man. They are clear plastic, so whatever color socks he wears shows through the shoes. I was such an idiot to fall for him. It's okay, happens to everyone. I looked over at the guy's clear Nike Air Force Ones with a green and yellow sock to match his green football jersey. Turning away, I pretended to sort through the bow ties as the dude walked past me to the dressing room. Listen, sis, I can't talk now. I walked towards the fitting rooms. He closed the door to the third room on the right. Me neither, Octavia said. I'm pouring me a glass of wine. Did mom tell you her insurance claim got rejected? For real, I murmured. They decided the surgery was cosmetic. I'm like, that's bullshit. She has to live with one breast now? Yeah, that'll really affect her confidence. I checked the other rooms to see if they were empty. So now she has to appeal the denied claim, Octavia said. What's the point of paying insurance? I swear she needs an attorney. Totally not fair. Okay, sister, I gotta let you go, okay? Do you know an attorney that can help mom pro bono? <sighs> I pulled the hot phone from my ear and knocked on the third door on the right. <laughs> Someone's in here. A burly voice responded as Octavia kept talking. Life sure is hard some days. We got to enjoy our happy moments when we get them. I agree, we have to live in a moment. I planted five more knocks on the door. Someone's in her, the guy replied again. Ronez, I was hoping that Jacob and I would work out. He was such a sweet talker on the phone. And those eyes, girl, Octavia said as I knocked again. Oh, well, I guess I'll talk to your ear off enough. Find out about that lawyer, okay? I will. All right, sister, bye. Love you, sis. I whispered as the door flung open. Damn it, I said I'm in her twice already. Mother fucker. That was the last word Jacob heard as I jammed my knife deep into his chest. I pushed the knife and slammed him into the mirror behind us, glass shattered. I stood close enough to kiss his pink lips as his convulsion shook my body. He tried to fight, but I continued to press him against the wall while my other hand covered his mouth to shut him the hell up. His cheeks expanded and constricted as I stared into those green eyes until his last breath. I yanked the blade out before I lowered him to the ground, blood dripping onto his crazy shoes. Ronez, why? That voice again. Shut up, Dr. Gilly. Too bad it had to be here in the mall. This Jacob would have been good company with my other stinky dead boys at home. Thanks, Fred. All right. And the story really gets wild after that. <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> so, uh, Michael, do you want to ask some questions or would you like me to read the uh, names of the other writers involved? Yeah. Who else was in this? You know, there was 13 writers in this and we could only have uh, four tonight. Ideally, we would have 13 reading all 15 stories, but that would take seven hours. So anyway, um, I'd like to mention Zane Andrea, Jesse Krenzel, mm -hmm. 
Sasha Wamstecker, John Reed, who you know well, mm -hmm. Jenna Rivieccio, Jack Ite, Shelley Lowenkopf, Silver Webb, and Stephen Vessels, and especially Silver Webb, who was um, the publisher and co-editor of this. It was her interest in this that uh, sort of got me out of a stupor thinking that I wanted to do it, but then realizing how much work it took. But mm -hmm. she was there every step, every grumble of the way. And so uh, she deserves profound thanks. And Mac, you you need to be taken out of your drunken stupor more often than, than you are now. <laughs> <laughs> so were these stories for each of you, were they all already written or did you write it specifically for Delirium Corridor? Mine was already written, but uh, Max asked for something Twilight zone -y, and I didn't know where to place this. I had, I had written this story and I had no idea where to place it because it was too, it's kind of too literary to go into horror and it's kind of too, way too horror to go into literary. And so I was kind of like, ah, I don't do that, but I love it so much. It's so weird. And it's like, and it was so weird that I was, I was so, so happy when he was like, I need something Twilight Zone. I'm like, I know what I could have said. <laughs> I can't wait. So. And Milda might not remember, but she sent me something else. Oh, shh, don't talk about that. No, what I'm, I'm saying is the stories <laughs> had to fit the theme. So if a writer I liked sent me something good, but didn't fit the theme. I asked them, send me something else, you know? And and I think Milda came up with something great, so. In, in my case, um, it was already written, but again, like you, Em, I was a little, I don't know where it fits. It, to me, it felt like a really good episode of Black Mirror. And then I get an email from, from Max saying, hey, I'm looking for stories that have kind of a Black Mirror kind of vibe. Hey, let's let's do this. So I was just happy that, you know, there was a home for a story about a, a man whose house is trying to kill him. <laughs> I, my, mine was uh, a, a, a success story. I, I was actually I submitted to I, I attended Max Talley's class uh, February. Was it February last year, Max? Yeah, it was like the last time there was ever a workshop in person. Yeah, had a workshop. Yeah, and I, I had submitted this to try to make it better and to get some feedback uh, in the class. And, and Max and Angela, they, they liked it. And it just blew me out the water. I wasn't expecting that phone call or email. Can I just say, Fred, I love the music soundtrack. Like oh, I've, never, <laughs> I've never heard anybody do that at a reading. Thank and it's you. for Zoom. It works so well for right. Zoom because it's like, Oh, uh, and transportative. You did a good job too. Like, Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I've, yeah. I was like, I'm just some schmuck reading, and Fred's actually <laughs> performing. <laughs> He's like got this whole audio thing going. Right. Like, here's my audio book version. <laughs> you guys already brought the A game. I I had to had to step up. It was either this or James oh. Brown, and I, I I couldn't find my wig. So, <laughs> Fred, you can redeem yourself by telling everybody where you're from originally. Oh, St. Louis. Thanks. And I am a diehard St. Louis Rams fan. The St. Louis Rams fan. Yeah, but you greatest show on you. turf. You'd rather be <laughs> in California in the winter. Oh yes. <laughs> so we have a question from Rachel, and this is for Fred. Are, are any of the characters inspired by actual people, or are they all from your imagination? Funny you say that. Uh, inadvertently, they ended up being nurses, and my mom's a nurse, so no. Can I, I think that came out the subconscious. Um, it started with the story, and and these and this was developed in like 2000, and I've always kept it, and I always went back to my stories. I always went back to them and kept trying to refine them, kept trying to hear these characters in my head and hear what they're trying to tell me and hear what ideas they want to get out, and. Her case, Ronez, became a story. Every choice is an act of love or a cry for love. And I wanted to personify that and demonstrate that through a story. Uh, she gets her heart broken. She gets life, pushes her to the edge. And she needs love to come and save the day. So love comes and it's not the love you think of. It's something far more sinister. Good question. Thank you. I guess I could pose that story for all of you as far as where do your characters come from? 
let's start with Milda. Sure. So this story did kind of come out of the fact that a lot of my friends and, and I, we, I mean, it's like a mom thing of like, is there mm-hmm. something wrong or is this just a normal mm-hmm. phase? And in the, in the very, very original, when this was, a, it was like a sort, little flash piece of fiction at, at, when I first wrote it down. And in that little flash piece of fiction, she just sort of accepts the kid because the therapist tells her that he's just normal and you're an idiot. And so she told, like, this kid is really, really not okay. And, <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and in the original version, he, she, she was just told, no, he's fine. You're just, you're, it's all you. And she's like, okay. So she goes and makes green goddess juice and is like, yeah, okay, he's fine. You know, and he's like, not. So, yeah, it just came, it came from that, that being told from the outside how to be a parent rather than like trusting your gut. But wasn't that source of that doctor was saying that she, she was treated like yeah. the 50 I mean, in this, other people for her? Yeah, in, this, in this version, the doctor is just like a th- He's like, he's just, he's just not a good doctor. <laughs> <laughs> it's my revenge on all the people who have like dismissed any kind of, you know. <laughs> was that my your revenge motivation on dismissing for the story? <laughs> Was that your motivation for this story then? You know, this story, I just, there was something about the images of like numbers and just sheets of numbers and walls of numbers Mm -hmm. and numbers carved into things. And I just thought that that was such a creepy image. And I wanted to write something with that, with that image Mm -hmm. of like all these weird numbers and how scary that is when you don't know if it's a threat or not, it's just a Mm -hmm. thing. So along that lines, Max, you know, what was your inspiration for your story? Um, when I first read this at the Santa Barbara Writers Conference, someone called it corporate Lovecraft, which I thought was uh, interesting. I like the idea that you're in a boring job and cubicles and it's everything that we hate uh, working in a mundane office. And then there's bizarre things outside, just outside of it. And I like the transposition of the dull, uh, realistic world with the dream world and all the possibilities, some of them very negative, that could happen to you when those two things intersect. So that was the basic idea. Interesting. Trey, you have some visitors behind you, are they? (laughs) Yes, yes, I could not keep the savage beasts away for the the entire call, I apologize. Um, In terms of my story, um, uh, kind of a running theme through a lot of my work is uh, quite frankly, because you see so much in the real world that awful people don't get what's coming to them, um, mm-hmm. that I like to write stories where awful people do get what's coming to them. Um, mm-hmm. so, you know, in terms of characters, you know, who better than an, an entitled CEO who believes, uh, that, uh, that morality doesn't really matter, um, in, in this particular story, what's odd about it is that it was actually, I wrote it uh, for a contest um, where I had uh, I had eight days to write a 2,500 word story and it had to involve a programmer and it had to, uh, it had to um, be about a, a particular topic. And now I don't even remember the topic. Mm-hmm. Um, it might've been comeuppance or something of that nature. Mm-hmm. So I just had a week to write it. I spit it out, refined it and entered it into the contest. So, and it sat on my hard drive until, until Max sent the email. So, but I, you know, characters, there's, there's always a little bit of, of the characters that you put in your stories. There's always a little bit of reality in them. So there may or my, my characters may or may not have been inspired by somebody in my past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't, I can't tell for sure. So how did you do in the contest? Uh, I took first place. Nice. Oh, there you <laughs> nice. Go. Bravo. Yeah. That, that story took first place in, in its heat. I didn't take first place in the whole contest, but that story took first place in, my, in, in one round. Congratulations. Congratulations. It's far mm-hmm. bigger honor to be, in, to be in this collection. Trust me. <laughs> cool. So uh, John, John asks, uh, John really enjoyed this book very much. And he wants to know, is there any plans to turn this into a Black Mirror type of offering on Netflix or Amazon Prime? Well, of course, that's the dream. 
and I've tried to copyright the delirium corridor idea. You can't really copyright a title, but I'm trying to copyright the anthology idea of it so that at some point with a lot of luck, this could be some kind of visual series because it seems to lend itself to that. Mm. So, so if John knows so, anybody, if John knows anybody, <laughs> directors, uh, people at Netflix, <laughs> and you know, it doesn't have to be Netflix. We'll we'll take HBO. Right. <laughs> and we got to write a part for Fred in there, especially with the sweater he's got on. So. Oh, you like my sweater? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, definitely gonna be there. He may be the guy who's stabbed in his own story because that was the only male character. <laughs> Want to so bring Fred, some Christmas who, spirit. <laughs> who would play your main character, Fred? Ideally, if you were adapted. Who, Ronez, who would play that character? She's referred to a lot. I try to use creative ways to describe her. And one doctor said, you're a dead ringer for Gabrielle Union. I don't know if you heard of that actress. Um, yeah. I could see yes. her playing, her, playing her. her role. Uh, I think she has the animation to uh, play a psychopath nurse that loves her patients. <laughs> All right, John, you got to hook a writer up here now. So Gabriel Union, let's get let's let's get this ball rolling, okay? That's all right. All right, we have another question from Andrea. For everyone, anyone who wants to answer, how did your relationship with writing change during the pandemic? That's a great question. Easy. I got quarantined with two kids and a husband. <laughs> my my office became what is that called? Like shared eyes. We work here. Everybody, everybody's always on zoom all the time. There's always, it's always loud. I cannot be precious. I have to write when I can find time and with other people around and yay. <laughs> yeah, you, you would think that that productivity for writers would have zoomed during the pandemic. I don't know if it did for most, it did not for me. Um, if anything, it, it reduced my productivity because quite honestly, I was kind of bummed out. I mean, life is not a lot of fun when you're quarantined and when you see what's, what's happening in, in the world. So I, you know, I, I, I muddled through, I got some writing done, but it, it definitely lowered my enthusiasm and my output. Mm. Unfortunately. Yeah. I think I want to uh, say real quick. Um, I was looking forward to the writer's conference, uh, last year and then you know the quarantine happened and I said I couldn't be around the community of writers again and, and get good feedback so it, it negatively affected me that way so that was my answer to that yeah and Max I, I think for like a month I was just brain dead I, you know March 15th to about April but then I got back into writing and I actually think having delirium corridor to work on you know, I wasn't forced to always be writing stuff. I could, I could be editing. I could be working on art. It was a, a nice little thing to have on the side um, to just work on where I didn't have to be completely focusing on this story, this novel, you know. So I would recommend during uh, times like this for everyone to do an anthology, you know, to edit an anthology. Editing isn't always fun, but um, it, it gets you through. It's a thing to do. And in the end, it's fun. Once you get through it and you forget all the hassles, it's really, uh, it's, it's a good feeling. It's like running, you know, where you're cursing the whole time you're running, but by the time you're done running, you feel really good. I would, I want to echo that, that having a community and if you don't have one, build one, find right. one, like find either your writing group, get on zoom. If you have, take a class, I don't know, find other people that write so that you can have that community. Cause it's like, it's tough not to be able to just like, you know, write all the time. So. A writing group is essential. And we've been so spoiled in Santa Barbara in the sense that we have the Santa Barbara writers conference. Now we have the Santa Barbara Literary Journal and Chaucer's mm -hmm. has always been supportive of both the Writers' Conference and now the Santa Barbara Literary Journal. So there's this kind of nexus close, um, I don't know what you call it, triumvirate um, connection between those. And it, it's, just, it's something that's sustaining. I think it helps. What I've noticed 
before we came on the air for everyone else that immediately we came on, it was just you guys immediately gravitated toward one another and just click. And I think that's an amazing synergistic thing for all of you to, to, to be able to do that. I mean, do you all actually like each other or? Nah, <laughs> not really. Not really. <laughs> not really. <laughs> I couldn't tell. Let me tell you, let me just say one thing. One of the best things about being an editor is you can reject a-holes. You, <laughs> even if they write a good story, you can put it to the side. It's, it's very nice to deal with people who are nice and who are generous and who are great writers. So I was very lucky with this collection. Well, and, and also I think writers, because it's such a solitary pursuit, and because we spend so much time alone in front of a computer, in front of you know a, a screen and wondering whether or not we're hitting the right marks, wondering if we're just toiling away for nothing, when we get a chance to interact with other people that share that passion and have those similar things, it's it's kind of like you know letting the toddler out for the first day of you know of preschool. They're they're just so excited. Oh my God, you understand. So mm. I, it's just kind of a um, kind of a shorthand that we all have with one another. We both, we all get the stresses and the joy and the, and the, you know, the, the plummeting awfulness that, that is part of being a writer. So I'll, I'll wrap it up with one question. What's next for everyone? Um, I'm going to be marketing my other book. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a couple of stories coming out in anthologies and I'm, I'm still trying to plug away and get another novel done. So. And, and I uh, <laughs> right. just want to announce uh, my book scramble has been accepted at Chaucer's bookstore. And uh, it's, av it's available there for everybody's viewing. I've received so many great uh, reviews on this and great feed feedback. Uh, my goal is to publish again after this. Uh, I finished a, a tour of Scramble. I have a second mm -hmm. book. Um, I have a goal to get finished by August. Oh. It's an right. awesome title. I Thank love you. the cover. The cover. And oh my god, the cover is awesome. That's like, not catch up. Gross. By the way, this yeah, one, no that's not catch up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I'm going to go out on a limb and say, yeah, for the guy who just had uh, who just had a, a guy nailed to the wall of a dressing room with a knife, yeah, that's probably not catch up. <laughs> yeah. All right, Max, bring it home. Okay, so um, for people who want to hear or read more of this book, I would send them to SantaBarbaraLiteraryJournal.com, where many of the other um, writers have snippets of their work. So they can find more information should they have not heard enough from these four authors tonight. But I'm so thankful to Michael and Chaucer's Books for their continuing support all these years. And to know these great other writers um, who were so happy to be part of this. It, it was a joy. Absolutely. Well, thank you everyone for joining us and please take a look at Delirium Corridor and the works of all these great authors. Thank you, uh, Max, Milda, Fred, and Trey. You guys were awesome. Keep up the good work. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having night. us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining, too. Take care. Be safe. Time for drinking. <laughs>